See, I think that the thing with the Tubin thing is I think it really does matter whether he was hard or not. You know? Because I mean, if if he yeah. was just, if he was if he was just jacking it, like that's yeah. that's insane, and and he probably yeah. wanted to be seen. I think, but I think if it was uh, his tube, it was soft. I think pipe is hard. I think <laughs> I I think that's the designation. I think that's the preferred medical term. Uh, I, so I want I want him to be soft, both because I think hard is obviously rude, and also because I want the New York Post to run something about Tubin's tube. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is one occasion where you definitely do want him to have done a no growth. <laughs> <laughs> and like his excuse There's for There's no is, details on it either. That's just no. what like, I, I need to know more. Um, yeah. If you're I'm a reminded, New Yorker staffer, please contact us. We need to know about Tubin's tube. <laughs> I am reminded of the philosopher J-Rock from Sunnyvale Trailer Park. But, uh, it could happen to you because it happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that I find credible about his excuse is that he said, I thought I had the video muted, which is such like a boomer fucking like, uh, how do I yeah. open PDF? You know, it's yeah. just like he had his audio muted and he was just like, well, time to whip it out. <laughs> well, like, what, hey, he, I totally believe that, that that's plausible. You know, you, like I'm going to argue to case, even though I don't like him, think he's a bad guy uh, to argue his case. I don't think he was jerking off because if you were going to jerk off, you're not going to do it like looking at your colleague. Like, first of all, there are probably 10 people on that Zoom call and you really have to isolate whatever woman you want to jerk off to. And she's mm-hmm. not like wearing like her tits aren't out. She's not like you with your dick out. Well, I mean, I, I, what, there, there is a kind of public masturbator that just actually likes the crowd, but I don't think that's his thing. I think he's an old man that walks around naked in his yeah. you know, apartment and... He could not but, open PDF. Council, council, council uh, calls to the witness stand himself in a tender of uh, a gym that a lot of old men go to. Yes, it is that it's the old Jewish guy thing of like they love being nude. They, they love, love showing you how big, how long their they balls can't are. Get over it. They, they can't have you ever stop being nude? Have you ever been like a <laughs> yeah. like like yeah like a YMCA or a YJCA or whatever it is? The it, like it, it's the old guys there. They. They need to. They can't just have walk out of the tower with a sh- with like you know a towel around their waist. They got the no. towels around their shoulders. They can't just put their underwear on under the towel. They want everyone to know and see how long their balls are. I've I've heard of this phenomenon. Um, I've also heard the uh, one leg up on the bench, airing it out, which to me just seems rude. <sighs> yeah. Well, like I know it's yeah. a locker room, but like you know, don't air them out. Like that's like hanging your laundry, you know. That always that always made me curious as a longtime gym attender to see that because it's like, well, like, like you know, they say if you aggressively dry your hair, it's bad for it, and like, do you risk tearing the sack, like an older sack, <laughs> if you like towel dry it? I mean, it's like, it does, it by does the end re- of your life, it's like crepe paper. You have to yeah. be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It does feel nice to air dry versus a towel. Of course, but but like I don't want to stay in the locker room. Like I want to get out of there. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to go. To I want to get out. Of, yeah, I want to get on with my day. But I guess when you're old, you know, like don't have really have work to do. You're probably avoiding, you know, your wife who's <laughs> poisoning you or you're poisoning her. Goes on. <laughs> uh, also, I gotta say, putting your putting your you're putting your foot up on the uh, on the bench. I mean, like that's also sort of a, an invitation to show hole too. I mean, yeah, no, they, they, yeah, they love everyone to see their asshole and they love they love having like a weird stain from not wiping. That's like permanently now part of their skin. Uh, now you I say- could when I close my eyes, I just see like old man balls and hole and I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> okay, now, you say, Felix, it'd be hard to like jack off on a Zoom call because you'd have to focus in. But what if one of the members of the Zoom call was David Remnick and he was like, you know, sort of. <laughs> charming you with his wit and erudition how could you know yeah. no yeah i would probably have it out but um i mean it's possible the man is a compulsive masturbator but i think we'd he- like <sighs> to be fair we've he- we've heard some things about jeffrey tubin you know just you just google his name in this regard well he's part of no condom gang <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly he is a king He's yeah. a condomless king. felix is on a is on a group text with him on the well, no yeah, condom we- boys group text yeah, I am Mr. Tubin's lawyer. Uh, <laughs> you know. From the law from the law firm of Cream Pie and Associates. This may change Tubin's this may change Tubin's opinion about Snowden though. 
because oh like, true yeah yeah because he was like he was like a big like we need to execute Edward Snowden guy yeah. like fuck Snowden guy and it's like well like the NSA is probably like this is not the first time a bunch of people have seen your cock flopping around on a Zoom call yeah like the NSA has probably looked through his webcam before Snowden you know? has excellent opsec he would never hop on a Zoom call unless he was in like a hermetically sealed box or something some Faraday yeah. cage before he jacks off yeah, yeah no. I do the tape thing over my. I mean, it's it's insane, but I I fear the unblinking eye of my webcam. I don't really do it because it's like, um, what are you going to see? My cans, my my look, my not my not my tits, but like my literal, <laughs> my literal. Like, yeah, but it feels like the thing is with me, you might see my cans. Yeah, the exactly. Other way. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I don't. I do mean, it. like I I like very rarely have my dick out because I think it like I don't know. It doesn't feel good to have it like dangling around like i like it like restrained i like wearing like tight mm-hmm. briefs that like um like holster the dick to the leg you like to feel cradled uh yeah, yeah. You know, i have yeah. a yeah i have like a dismemberment uh fear like an illogical dismemberment fear like i have a huge fear of having my dick cut off i think and that's castration fear and that's I not think illogical it's that's trauma pretty- it's trauma from when it happened before. He's already, yeah, it's true. He's him. He's him, and I are are victims of a tragic gender That's right. Yeah, That's yeah, right. No, they're, yes, coming, they're coming for the they're they're coming for the rest of it. And, <laughs> but it's like I've I've broken like three or four French presses, just knocking them off counters by accident with your dick. <laughs> no, 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 no. That would be so. Stop I mean, bragging. That's like stop your professor. Bragging. That's like your all professor right, joke of a hoardy right. of a hoardy professor just knocking over all the Bunsen burners with his boner. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I, I, there are like permanent like blood stains on my floor just from like knocking over a glass thing and stepping on it, and it's what? like you're not that much farther away from like I don't know if I had like a big knife fall on the floor and I tripped and cut my dick off. So like I True. like I'm trying to like really not accidentally cut my dick off. You know, like, well, Felix, on. Felix, uh, there's good yeah. news for you. There's there there is a device. It's sort of like um it's a it's a protection it's like a sort of extra protection for your dick and balls. It's a little cage you can lock them in. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, no, I'm all right. That. All right, well, let's move on before we before we uh are, are just the pe- everyone out there with like this a, a Felix. Talk. Fe- Felix chastity fetish is just going insane right now, and I don't want no, to give them any a, more uh, fodder. It's not, a fetish. it's not a fetish for me. It's like I think it's just like I need to do it. It's well, it's it's a good investment. It's just like you keep your yeah. valuables in a safe place. Mm-hmm. It's a safe deposit box. Yep. All right. Well, let's. Uh, should we clap in and kick off the show for real? Yes. <laughs> Uh, you've been listening to Two Talk. This is Will Menneker, and up next on NPR is All Things Considered. All right, so I would like to kick off uh, officially the show. Um, it's, it's me, Will. We've got Felix, Matt, and Amber here. I'd like to kick off officially the show by saying this. The people of Bolivia may not be Dave Navarro, but they will be Living Moss. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right, folks. You are all examples of the live moss mentality. I am talking about the, uh, just, I don't know, landslide election results from Bolivia in, in the fake do-over election that they had to do uh, after deposing Evo Morales in a coup. Uh, wouldn't you know it? Uh, his party just fucking won the, the election by about 20 points. Um, I would yeah. Like- no, I just want to say real quick, uh, we, we got to mention this at the top of the, the show because I think it's probably the most important news story in the world right now. But tomorrow I will be conducting an interview with an independent journalist in Bolivia about the uh, recent election and everything that's led up to it and what may happen now. But uh, we couldn't get him on today. Uh, as you might imagine, he's probably pretty busy. But uh, look forward to later in the week a extra bonus episode where I will be talking to a journalist who knows what he's talking about on this matter. But before then, uh, guys, what are your, what are your just your reactions to this uh, fairly phenomenal victory by the MAS party in uh, the Bolivian elections? And I should say elections in quotation marks because there was no reason to have this election in the first place because it just replicated the results of the one that they canceled the last time. And if anything, went even further to make Moss even more popular. 
Moss won by a bigger margin than they did last time. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, crybabies, um, both trying to pretend that they were, uh, you know, just sort of uh, blithely taking it all in or uh, actually openly commiserating about it. Getting mad at Camacho, the far right candidate who they believe acted as a spoiler, but as ah, a Jill Stein. Yeah. <laughs> of the, of yeah. The... Yeah, <laughs> those Prius well, but, Bolivars. But he did not. Camacho did not act as a spoiler because Moss passed the fifty percent threshold. Yes, they would have mm. won an outright victory even if the Czech Nazi vote was fully consolidated. And, <laughs> and not only that, but this is this is the, the election took place after Janine Anes. Uh, she dropped out her like the interim president, that the crazy broad who just like brought a Bible into the presidential fucking uh, the, oh, like, the yeah. the White House and just said that she was the president of the country. She dropped out of contention because like the the, the people opposed to MAS realized that like she was going to be the one to split the vote between like the center right party and her, you know, Christian theocratic party. So when that happened, I was a little bit nervous. But like, man, what a resounding victory for fucking Moss in that country. Yeah. Just, uh, unalloyed good news for the first time in a long time. And I, I mean, guess we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, mean, I know. It's not mean, going to be their last attempt. Oh God, no. I mean, look what they did. Yeah. Look what they did. Like, look, look at everything that had to happen to get to this point. So it's a little hard to say, like, oh, what what good news or whatever. But the thing I've been noticing from like the the globe emoji sicko set is that they're using evidence that like their coup attempt failed to justify saying that it, there was never a coup in the first place. And they were like, oh, it looks like it was just a free and fair election. Oh, all the crybabies didn't know what they were talking about. And it's just like, just because it didn't work doesn't mean there was a fucking coup. And the fact yeah. that they had these free and fair elections are only the result of a mass popular and militant popular movement of MAS supporters, labor unions, and fucking social movements in that country, many of whom were killed by the interim government to get to this point. So it's just like, oh, it didn't work out. Oh, I guess guess uh, it was always a free and fair democracy. And that what you know, oh, what are you lefties crying about? Like they they conceded power. What's the problem? It's like, well, Evo Morales left fucking power after being deposed unfairly. So what does that it's, they, you were saying he was a fucking dictator. So what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. it all it, it also means that they can't make the argument that Trump is a unique fascist and used to browbeat everyone anymore because didn't he just voluntarily let his party lose during the midterms yeah what matters here is is that they tried so hard the coup government to delay the election to to uh disqualify moss from being able to to actually run in it use every procedural trick to try to essentially test how far they could go in establishing this new rule how much resp resistance they were going to get and at every level they've hit so much fucking resistance including like uh, short-lived uh you know general strikes and 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 uh occupations blocking major highways and reducing any kind of uh economic activity in the whole fucking capital uh meant that they were essentially forced to hold an election and that's the the really the good news of you know of the of the whole thing is knowing that there's still enough juice you know in those uh in those organizations in that like heavily unionized working class that they're able to make that sort of assertion and the cynical response can be well you know but clearly the coup itself had the purpose even if they weren't able to get rid of Moss they were able to put a scare into Moss to ensure that when Moss comes back it'll be disciplined and will be able to be more tractable because it knows how far things can go. And the thing is, that's probably true to an extent. I mean, if they'd really wanted to not have an election, they could have just risked uh, just massacres and see what happened. Mm -hmm. So they clearly felt like they had a little bit of leeway there. But as you said, what's going to determine how good this news is is how uh, what happens now. Like, how do popular movements that got uh, Moss back into power respond to Moss in power and the inevitable U.S.-led attempt to overthrow them or have them compromise away from uh, representing uh, the Bolivian people. The interim government before this election, um, they delayed the election day several times. They closed down uh, polling, lo you know, voting locations on, in the rural parts of the country so that like thousands of people were waiting in line and a, a move that may sound familiar to anyone here in America. But they tried to go ahead with this election by simply, but they, they initially tried to ban voting in the country's largest region. That was the like stronghold of them. And they tried to ban MAS as a political party from standing in the election before this free and fair election. So, I mean, keep well, that in I mind. Mean, 
it is kind of unfair for them to vote because there's so many of them. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's there's more of them than kind the other cheating. side. <laughs> it's kind of cheating. I mean, that is the approach to like this this new you know the ruling classes here. It's like as the veneer of democracy, th- you know, gets uh, thinner. Like your tolerance for popular participation wanes because it's the only thing that could genuinely uh, hurt you. And like uh, uh, this, honestly, should be the fact that that this election went forward and the fact that Moss won and is going to take power again should really put some fucking hold water on the embers of any delusions in america that we're going to see some sort of coup after the november election i'm sorry if they couldn't pull that off here i just don't buy that we can pull it that that they would pull it off here unless there's so little concern about any popular response if they were to do it that they could pull it off and then you got to ask yourself is that the country you live in I i don't know I'd be interested in um, knowing more because Bolivia is weird. I mean, we talk about like indigenous populations like being, you know, uh, sort of political demographies in all sorts of countries. But really, most of the time, they are not so separate as they are in Bolivia. I mean, they have like something like over over a third of the population is like indigenous and a lot of them like still live traditional lifestyles and they still have indigenous movements of like very large numbers of people and they even though like poverty has been sort of closed up or not closed up but they're they're narrowing the 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 poverty the inequality uh numbers and have been since like for a long time uh like they haven't been industrializing quickly so this is still like a country that isn't really industrialized that still has like um, like a meaningful like labor movement and still has like people living pretty traditionally in the middle of nowhere, which is hurting a lot of cats. Like that's really, really difficult. I don't know. It just seems really interesting because it's like not necessarily like even other countries like around it. Like we tend to like collapse all of the Latin American countries, but Bolivia is like weird. Yeah, uh, Evo actually came from that like evo yeah. is indigenous he came from a cocoa farmers union that way like it sort of got its start in anti-imperialist politics against the sort of like uh american-led anti-cocoa campaign it is yeah it's very different to electoral left movements that we we, we find familiar but uh yeah i don't I don't know what lessons we could quite take from their success and incorporate it here, but it is, I mean, it's an amazing story and very atypical. I mean, I think, I mean, it's exceptional even for the region. I think the main takeaway is that actually, um, bangs are good and winners have them. Well, Evo, (laughs) Evo, amazing guy, winning smile, great hairline. Great hairline. Starts like an inch above his eyebrows. Uh, he looks okay, awesome. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Ha- I'm. Yeah. I'm. I. Uh, I'm still a young man. I'm gonna have to get treatments for mine. Avo, <laughs> not the case. Avo, great hairline on one side. Yasha Mount, awful hairline on the other side. Like, <laughs> oh god, it, it, that's like, true. His yeah. Hair, his, his hairline you runs can tell on the version of Chad in there just from sight. I think this. Does his hairline run on lithium or something? Because it's receding <laughs> at a dramatic rate. And uh, I, 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 ch- I checked his account today. He hasn't tweeted at all about this. But in case you forgot, Yasha was one of these fucking dipshits. Yeah, the, the founder of the new Persuasion blog and podcast was one of the, the loudest voices on sort of like the American capitalist press of like the Atlantic and the ec- Economist or whatever, assuring everyone that what happened last year was definitely not a coup, but in fact a right. victory for democracy and the Bolivian people. Except now that it failed, like it's like clearly it's neither of those things. It was clearly just a glitch in the machinations. It's the most like I wasn't trying that time, but also I wouldn't have been trying because that would be wrong. Like it's just it's, it's the most trying to have it both ways thing. Yeah, it's the equivalent would be like if if people who supported our, that idiotic coup attempt in Venezuela were like the fucking like these like wannabe mercenaries got caught by fishermen. Like if they would defend themselves by saying, "Well, that wasn't a coup attempt because our guys got caught." Mm-hmm. If it if it was a coup, you'd know it was a coup. Yeah, if it was a coup, it would have worked. 
And even then, yeah. they, they would say it's not a coup. It was actually a democratic revolution of you know uh, people and principles over a tyrant. Yeah, it's the most I can dunk when no one is looking kind of loser talk. Here's something very perverse about Yashimuk that I did not know. Did you know he's a kraut he's from G- Krautland? He's German. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's a German who emigrated and got citizenship here. Fuck off! Yeah. <laughs> Why would you come here? You had it so much better. Uh, like, to leave Ger- Like, we were in Germany. It's not perfect, but, like, Jesus Christ. He there- left the land of funky beats. <laughs> Ger- <laughs> or Germany, so funky if, beats. You're, if you're a guy like Monk, like, it, it, it's like you've had somebody ruling Europe with an iron fist with your exact ideology, and you leave there so you can write shitty articles about the Portland mayoral election. Why? Well, actually, you left the promised land. I I do know why, Felix. Uh, So uh, Yash is Jewish and I think his family like relocate. Like, I I don't they made it out. Uh, But he wrote a big, long thing about how he felt like a stranger in Germany, which is insane because like the philo Semitism of like post like Holocaust Germany is actually weird. Like Felix basically got uh, carried around on a on one of those uh, palanquin things, like while we were in Berlin. <laughs> like, so he said he felt like outside, and I could see them being weird about it because they are, you know, cab drivers will be like, "We're so sorry about the Holocaust." And you're like, "I'm just trying to get to Alexanderplatz." <laughs> yeah, well, like if you can't make any friends as a Jewish like market urbanist centrist, yeah. In, in, in Germany, that's their dream. There, yeah, now. The, the, you are supposed to be their king, buddy. I just yeah. think like he, he yeah. could have had a, he could have had a decent career doing the exact same thing and believing all the same bullshit that he does in Germany and had like probably had a better life. But because it's Germany and like you know, no one no one would be telling him to shut the fuck up when he shares his cretinous thoughts and like that's the juice that gives him attention and a career in America, which is really what counts. You know, like you can't you can't be a celebrity in Europe. You know, you got to come to America. Yeah, it, to, for to, for him to be told to shut up in Germany, they would have to bring me in like Frank Pentangeli's brother in God's. <laughs> <laughs> Angela Merkel, like the Nevada senator, being like, I've long had good relations with the Jewish people. They're hard working, <laughs> industrious. They're very good with money, but I won't hold it against them. <laughs> uh, yeah. But Yasha has uh, the weird hairline, too, because, and I figured it out, it's because it doesn't go in at the sides the way it's, it's, a, it's a steadily receding straight line. So it starts like a normal hairline, but like on top of his head. It's very confusing. It looks tonsured in some way. Yeah, but you know, I mean, if you look at his, I mean, he's doing Yashar level Avi fraud, and I think he needs to be brought up in charges. I mean, for, for a lot for a lot of reasons, but you know, that being chief among them. Anyway, though, I mean, there's a just just a just a, uh, we. I will be talking a lot more, you know, intelligently about Bolivia with someone who, you know, is from there and uh, has been doing very good reporting on um, on Moss and and the movements supporting this this big victory. And but also, I mean, just I'm interested to hear what people think comes next, because, I mean, obviously this is this is good news on its face. But I mean, like, does anyone doubt like what this what what what, what the conference rooms at Langley, the Virginia have on their mm-hmm. whiteboard right now? Because. I mean, I shudder to think. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, is right cool, next though. Is Congratulations, Joe Biden, on your big victory. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I can't I, I can't wait to I can't wait to see Joe Biden's like Mr. Burns attempts to do this once he's in there. <laughs> Where? Yeah. <laughs> Where's Batista, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you know these? I did auto- not. As the 430 auto gyro to Prussia left, man. Oh, man, I shouldn't have sent that letter. <laughs> yeah, this no, is, they'll be they'll be halfway through a coup they'll be halfway through taking the palace and aiming artillery on protesters and then you'll just hear over a loud speaker speaker oh man i shouldn't have done that man I'm sorry <laughs> and then the military just retreats uh. a very good segue because I have a very funny article about uh, Joe Biden and the CIA come courtesy of uh, Politico yesterday. 
Uh, headline here, Biden would revamp fraying intel community. Intelligence has, become, <laughs> intelligence has become a political weapon under Trump, the Democratic nominee's advisors say. When has intelligence been anything other than a political weapon ever? Yeah. Yeah, it's just like the way what? the, the no. way Democrats love to is. talk about the intelligence community, and they've been doing ever, this ever since the Bush administration because they had to have some way to justify the fact that the CIA completely went along with all that weapons of mass destruction bullshit. Is like they talk mm. about the politiz like po intelligence being politicized, like right the like the uh, the act of creating intelligence for a government is anything other than political and they think yeah. that like the cia just creates objective research and facts about the world and they give it to the yeah. executive branch to be like here's what you need to know sir make your decision and not the exact other way around like they're you know just, they're just taking exactly notes like, like like harriet the spy it's just they're observers they're just you know adorable little girls you know it's exactly the same way that they view the supreme court yes they they yeah. view both of these yeah. things as somehow institutions that stand outside of the political order and, and that is a, the fundamental liberal insanity uh and it makes sense that they view these things that way when it, they are so transparently not i would add on top of that pointing out i would add on top of that the kind of uh conspiracy minded um approach that they have to these things i was talking about this yesterday with felix with uh with josh and dave but remember when the big bombshell the latest bombshell there's one every two weeks and it doesn't matter at all if not weekly was that trump had been quote targeting black voters which made it sound like there was like a little red scope dot on their heads what he had been doing is called campaigning you're describing campaigning and going after specific demographics trying to get some to vote some not to vote some to vote for you some to just get so bored and frustrated and fed up with everything that they don't bother like that's literally campaigning. And to yes. the Democrats, doing literally anything, whether it's gathering intelligence or running a campaign or, you know, having a, a, a making a Supreme Court decision, it's not political when they're doing it, but it's very it's a political conspiracy when the Republicans are doing it. It's completely insane. It's like just they won't admit what actual politics is, which is a battle using the tools that we have made for ourselves, some of which are inherently evil and some of which are just fucking politics. Well, mm -hmm. I, I mean, just back to this Politico article, the headline, um, uh, Biden would revamp fraying intel community. And I have no doubt that that's true. And in fact, I think that will be one of the only things a Biden administration will actually get done. Oh, is, yeah, yeah. Is revamp, our institutions. revamp the CIA. But... The article begins with this. Like how? Like new staplers? <laughs> <laughs> new staplers, less accountability. But no, no, here, here's what they're talking about in terms of revamping. What they mean is, is morale at Langley. So the article begins with this hysterical anecdote. More hang in there kitten posters. President Donald Trump was in the middle of receiving a highly classified briefing on Afghanistan at his New Jersey golf club when he suddenly craved a malted milkshake. Uh, just okay. First of all, receiving highly classified intelligence briefings at his New Jersey golf club is funny enough as it is. But friends, whom amongst us has not just been zoned out in some boring fucking meeting or really at any point in your life and not wanted a delicious malted milkshake? They're yeah, great. He, he I could go big, for one right now. I got to tell you. Oh I, yeah, the the dairy block over here in the Midwest is is already salivating. I, I want to. Right uh, now. I I want to read into this deeper. He's trying to capture the Biden magic. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. He, yes. This is his way of getting in his head. This is his way of walking a mile yeah. in another man's moccasins. I, Biden, I, I would Biden, say takes, uh, Biden takes medicinal milkshakes for his dementia. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to capture it. I think, I, think, I think this was years ago, though. This was before the campaign really heated up. So it just says here, uh, so he's getting an intelligence briefing from the CIA, and he goes, does anyone want a malt? He asked the senior defense and <laughs> intelligence officials gathered around him, an August group that included the head of the CIA's Special Activities Center, <laughs> which is responsible for covert operations and paramilitary operations. We have the best malts. You have to try them, Trump insisted. Folks, as he beckoned, folks, as he beckoned I'm just going to order one. I'm just going to order one, but we're all going to get our own straw. It'll be really order, fun. <laughs> order, order, fry, order fries so I can eat them. <laughs> I don't want to get fries on my own meal. I'll feel bad. I just love that he, okay, he's sitting there with the, the head of the CIA's special activities branch, you know, read assassination and genocide uh, division. Yeah. And then he's like, if, if you get a malt 
and then you get the fries, dip the fries in the malt. It's still a treat. Not many people know about that. In fact, they're not very talking about it until Trump did it. <laughs> so, he goes, so, so he's sitting in a room with like possibly like the most evil members of like the American deep state and intelligence community. Like guys who these, these guys are way further up the ladder than that asshole Elizabeth Warren endorsed. Who's just like, hey, everybody, I, I work very closely with Colombia's special forces <laughs> during operations in that country. And it just, yeah, yeah, the Colombian special forces. Good guys. But so he pauses whatever bullshit fucking like they're probably trying to get him to do a coup in a country. And then he's just like, you got to try our milkshakes. They're the best. So listen to this. Yeah. Trump insisted as he beckoned a waiter into the room where code word classified intelligence was being discussed. (laughs) The malt episode, which took place a few months after Trump took office in 2017, became legendary inside the CIA, said three former officials. That's just how good the malts were, though. God, wow. (laughs) They went from some guy like in a bar in northern Virginia talking about how he suffocated Patrice Lumumba with a laundry bag. (laughs) And now you got these guys going, and then he ordered a malted (laughs) milkshake. (laughs) So it goes here. It was seen as an early harbinger of Trump's disinterest in intelligence, which would later be borne out by the new president's notorious resistance to reading his classified daily briefing, known as the PDB and his impatience with the briefers, current and former officials said. But what initially seemed like mere boredom, which demoralized intelligence officials, but could potentially be, but, but could, could potentially be managed by including pictures and charts and briefings to hold the president's attention, later morphed into something the officials saw as more sinister, an interest in wielding intelligence as a political cudgel, whether selectively declassified by spy chiefs he installed for their loyalty or obscured from per- congressional and public scrutiny if it conflicted with his preferred narrative intelligence became just another weapon in the president's arsenal wow the cia was just like wait a second this guy's gonna hold back classified information from congress if it suits his agenda i've never been more demoralized Mm. how okay how would you were you joe biden raise morale in uh in in the deep state intelligence services i think for me i'm gonna go ahead and say hallmark holiday like a secretary's day, they get flowers, they get little, they get little funny cards. Um, you know, it's the little things. They matter. Uh, yeah, James Jesus Angleton Day. Everyone comes to the office at Langley in a <laughs> wacky costume. Yeah, yeah. Everyone gives each other, like, their soda, but it says poison on it, and it has a skull and crossbones. They're like, ha-ha, it's a joke. Yeah, there's fun theme parties, you know, there's, like, little rice and uh, little Rice Krispies cakes, you know? <laughs> rice and Krispie about, treats. <laughs> what about, instead of, like, Spirit Week, like they have at schools, you have Gladio Week. <laughs> yes. I mean, like, then, the yeah, the theme days would be great. And there are, like, cute office false flags. Like you eat, <laughs> Like, you eat somebody's treat out of the break room, and then, like, doctor security cam footage to make it look like you know the office prankster did it but you actually did it yeah yeah uh, or false. you frame up someone you don't like and uh uh mail them a secret letter telling them to kill themselves cia yeah, cia exactly cia field day with a false flag football and uh, a three-leg yeah. race and that means that they uh, cut off one of your legs and you have to hobble <laughs> with another person <laughs> across the finish line um no but yeah just going down in the article first of all uh, look, I, at, at the end of the day, Orange Man is bad and him being president is very dangerous. And just the fact that he doesn't give a shit about it, what any of these equally evil people have to say is good in one sense, because this genuinely should be the attitude of every president is like just throw these presidential daily briefings in the fucking trash because they're worthless. Like, I mean, you're either you're they're either trying to actively work you and propagandize to you or you're in on the con. It's like, you know, look to your right, look to your left. You can't find the sucker. It's you. In this case, Mm -hmm. Trump is the sucker. But like his essential disinterest and laziness is sort of an inoculation against that. That being said, like this is. I fully expect Biden to follow through on this and only this campaign promise. And what they want is it says, uh, quoting here, it says, this will be the most important things a Biden presidency would need to do and that he'll want to do immediately, said Tony Blinken, who served as deputy, deputy secretary of state and deputy national security advisor under Barack Obama and is a top advisor to the Biden campaign. I know from several conversations with him about this that he has a deep concern about what has been done to the IC these last several years in terms of politicization and repairing that starts at the top with the president. 
Blinken recalled Biden telling him in February 2017, shortly after leaving office, that the thing he missed most about being vice president was receiving the PDB every morning. Well, I, I like uh, it. In, I like it in the morning homework? too. Yeah. Whose favorite part of school wasn't homework? <sighs> but yeah, I mean, I guess like this, you know, uh, should Trump lose this election? I mean, like this is one of the things that we'll miss about him is him demoralizing the intelligence community with his antics. Yeah. I don't want him to get sad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you guys, we should. You know what? I'd say next month, you guys, how about all of the psyops that we do on behalf of the intelligence department uh, to sheepdog uh, revolutionaries away from uh, the left and to the Democratic Party? How about we just do it for free? Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's good to give back. I think. Yeah. Because really, we're in it for the love of the game. I mean, it's more a than good anything, job. It's a good and the job. love of the intelligence community. <laughs> We love them, and they love us. We love them, <laughs> they love us. We love them so much. We love it's them just... so much. We share big malteds with them. Oh, we love to sit in the booth. You sit next to them in the booth. You drink a malted. It's it's the little things, and just the thought of these these absolute monsters just being like just grinding their teeth down to the gums because when they're trying to like, <laughs> you know, like they're, they're trying to show him a big map with every arrow pointed at Tehran or something, and then he's just like, who wants a salad where a, pump, where a pumpkin is carved to look like a jack-o'-lantern and you eat the cheese out of the jack-o'-lantern? We have them here. They're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that really does sound like something they would have. You know what I mean, though? But, like, it, it, a, a Trump is, a, is a, a dangerous lunatic, but, like, his attitude towards this bullshit is the correct one. You shouldn't have these yeah. meetings. Don't Pay read no this mind. PDB. This Pay no mind to any control. of these people. Yeah. They're all... Yeah. They are all literally trying to lie to you and control to you. Yeah. And then like artificially uh, narrow the parameters of what is like a conceivable action you can take on like an international scale or domestic. The actual deep state. Yeah. Yeah. The genuine, real, for real, not joking deep state. Not and Nellie Orr and uh, her, her lovely husband, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> I would just, and you I would, know what, though? They like, uh, this, is, this is actually something that... <sighs> It's not that I think it's that Trump is a less damaging on the ledger uh, force than, say, like a right wing Democrat. Uh, I'm just saying there are perks and there is there is like, you know, there's no way to perform this kind of cost benefit analysis where it's like, well, is a, you know, interference in Venezuela worth. Um, the more rapid degradation of what little social welfare we have. Like, it's not, I mean, those are things you can't really compare. But I will say that, I and I, odds are Biden's going to win. Um, I, I will miss feeling more secure about, like, what, like, evil black ops shit we're probably not doing just because, just because, he, like, uh, Trump would say, that's a bad deal. That's a bad deal. How does that benefit us? You know, I mean, to be to be fair, Trump has like greatly expanded the number of like covert ops and like civilian deaths that have happened, you know, under even Obama. But I like, I, you know, like he, any Republican president would have done that. I any just like Republican knowing that president would have done that. That stuff yeah, is l- largely I, on automatic. And because of the because of Democrats have to be muscular now, they always ramp up and have to have a new project to show that they're not pussies, that they're not pussy dove peaceniks. And so like, you they know, always like get a new project. This is not like a moral calculus in terms of like, well, more or less people being murdered by the U.S. war machine overseas. But it's just like I just like knowing that like he can, you know, insult a five star general to his face and like make him wear roller skates for his amusement or something like that. <laughs> Your and, son and, like, died like a chump. And just like the very least, like some fucking like some. Some fucking moron like Joe Biden will just come in there and immediately start kissing their ass and just hold like a big all school assembly at Langley and be like, you're valuable, man. We care about you. I know yeah, it's been that, tough, that, but, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, I, I feel your harm. You are seen. That is that is that is an intangible that I actually dread about the Biden presidency is the CIA having self-respect back. If there's any oh God, group no. of Americans, if there's any body of the American deep state that needs to feel less self-respect and more. Uh, I mean, them being utterly confused by the way things are happening now probably has slowed them down. Just being like, their, what, what their swag it? must not be restored. Yeah, yeah I um. You know, we started the show talking about Bolivia, and I always think of that awful Chris Murphy tweet storm where he's like, 
uh, the Trump people are too incompetent to help us knock over Maduro. Um, <laughs> I would hate to see what they do when they have their when they have the oh, spring yeah. and their step back. Yeah. I really do not want that. Uh, we saw it at the beginning of Obama's first term, what that looks like. Uh, I don't want to see it again. And yeah, no, like like Will alluded to, there have been more civilian casualties. There's a looser rule of engagements, but it's not like it was uh, just a fucking by the book handcuffing of those things under Obama either. Um, you know what? It, you're, you're, I, the way you frame it is exactly right, Felix. Though it's about these people individually and their courtiers in in the national security press and and the you know media overall. They, I don't want them to be able to lie to themselves about the nobility of their work or what they actually yes. do or like their actual function in the world and in our state is. And like this sure. idea is like we were subjected to like so much propaganda about the CIA during the Obama years with shows like Homeland or Zero Dark Thirty. We're like coming out of the Bush years, like people were just like, oh, aren't you guys like the torturers? Don't you just like disappear people into like dungeons, to like pull their fingernails out? But then, no, like then they, 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 there was like a huge and I think totally concerted effort to use like the Hollywood and like TV shows to rebrand themselves as sort of like liberal defense like journalists basically what like what t- movies and tv did to the journalism profession the cia did for themselves they're now they're like we're flawed we're a little bit fucked up but basically like we're public servants who care about the truth yeah. the facts and we're also epic girl bosses yeah, we're I'm, silly. yeah I, 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 I'm silly i'm silly i'm inspiring <laughs> i get mine i've killed thousands well i, I sell I, cocaine i think i think their restless sleep is ultimately kind of cold comfort but all we can sort of do now is enjoy our glee but I I don't know I also think I just remember those you know if Hillary was president now we'd be at brunch t-shirts and I'm like yeah but like we'd also probably be in Venezuela like I really do think like there is a more um the long game um sort of you know uh democrat project of deposing democratically elected uh, elected leaders is more effective under under like an it is it is and amber actually it's it's also more imperative for a democratic administration to yeah. remove any counter examples to like neoliberal liberal capitalist parties because like it ruling. delegitimizes I, them exactly like the fact that bolivia was a functioning country that reduced poverty redistributed wealth while growing and, mo- and like you know growing the bolivian economy is an example that cannot be allowed to be maintained. That's what like Kissinger said explicitly yeah. about Allende in Chile. He said the, the danger with Allende is not that he's putting people in gulags, is that he, he isn't. Yeah. And he was democratically elected and popular, and that's why he's yeah. got to go. So for the Democrats... And Bolivia is even worse because it's like they did so much with so little. And so with yeah. our extreme glut of wealth and the disparity in this country, it seems even more absurd when you see the improvements yeah. in this tiny country where like 40% of people are like indigenous literal peasants. If I can point to one uh, one of the only good things Obama did in his second term, he seemed less engaged from the idea of actively removing governments of a more active mm. American imperial posture. In the first term, there was a lot of that. Nicaragua, Libya, mm-hmm. just Honduras. Yeah, God knows, God Syria. knows, yeah, God knows what else. And then in the second term, he seemed far less interested in that. And from everyone's accounting of it, it seems to be that Obama was the only sort of bulwark against the active machinations of no, the plot. He just didn't have to I, run I, again. I, yeah, with Biden, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? He was uh, he helped whip up, whip up support for the Iraq War. He was apparently a voice in favor of intervention in that second Obama term. So we'll see. I mean, his cabinet gives us no comfort. Uh, the people around him give me no comfort. I mean, I, I, I literally have no idea, but I will say that the actual chaos of Trump is a strange kind of comfort because it does really gum up the works. The one, the, the, the one thing that I, I think is working in the favor of good is that Americans seem to have lost their appetite for foreign intervention? But mm-hmm. who know who knows what a um, a democratic propaganda machine for that will look like? I think it's yeah. going to be a lot. I think it's going to be a lot of. Uh, are you invalidating the voices of the you know descendants of Czech Nazis in this country? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I could see that, and I could see like uh, like them bringing back the kind of 
you know, crowdsource, uh, you know, war uh, consensus model where they, they have all of these um, uh, focus groups and, and they try and like, they develop like, I mean, you, you saw it in, in Vice. Um, and I think people haven't talked about that as that aspect of it as much as you would, as, or as influential as it was. But the amount of like marketing research that they did to be able to sell what was ultimately an incredibly unpopular war to people. I mean, they really, it's horrifically as, impressive. And I think as, that they would return to that. As Bush chief of, as Bush's chief of staff, Andy Card said of the Iraq war, you don't roll out a new product in August. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, so I mean, it. yeah, to be clear here, there are two, the, the American political system is two imperial parties, both selling slightly different brands of imperialism in the Republican one, depending on what flavor of Republican you get, you get more active invasions and occupations, or you just get chaotic disinterest and, you know, a higher degree of civilian casualties well, there- in existing operations that would ha- happen with any president. And in the democratic one, we'll see. I think what the Democrats have in store is very evil. I, to, to, to your point, Felix, though, like a Republican administration just like won't need to justify it as much because if they decide to overthrow a country, I mean, Trump has really cracked the dam in that. They'll just say, hey, they have lithium we want or that's our yeah. oil and we're going to have a victory. What the Democrats will do, especially when it comes to uh, popular movements and like democratically elected governments and countries that, you know, we wish were, you know, in our pocket. I think they will do a mirror image of the argument Republicans make to justify the Electoral College where it'll just be like, um. Uh, yeah, like just a pure vote based tally of like who gets to lead these countries is actually marginalizing uh, the minority populations of those countries, i.e. wealthy right. people. It's othering them. And like, you know, we need to like, you know, we need to make it a little bit more fair so that these groups are not, you know, marginalized or silenced yeah. and that their voices are heard. The last acceptable yeah. prejudice is that of uh, against the elites. We're we're. We've fallen a very far, far way since the 70s where it was a more mainstream position to demand abolishment of the CIA. In any like realistic left electoral platform, I would like to see something about in, co- in common understandable language that everyone can access about imperial pullback, about getting rid of some of these intelligence apparatuses mm. of maybe outright destroying some i would really like to see that well, just, in just, the coming years I, it, it wouldn't be that hard of it wouldn't be that big of a lift too because it just you simply like no. th- th- they exist be- based on the popular perception that like the cia is there to work in the darkness to keep us safe and if we just simply acknowledge that, that that's not what they do, they don't they've keep us safe it, at they all. Made the world they've, made, they've made they've Amer- made individual American lives, but mostly the rest of the planet, a fantastically more violent and dangerous place to live. Tell the average American, every time that you have to fly from like fucking Louisville to New Bismarck, why are they blasting your bodies with X-rays? Why are they groping your kids? Why are they digging through all your possessions? Yeah, it's the same security theater. It's they tell you it's because the world is unsafe. It's unsafe for us because we have to be involved in fucking everything. I think that you want to live this life. That's actually the challenge, because one of the more difficult things now is that it's left less visible. Um, Whereas, you know, uh, you know, the ground troop wars, it was just so much easier to be like, bring our boys home. What are we doing? there? But. The airport thing is actually a very good point, Felix, because like I think everyone has had an incident where they watched someone like lift an ancient old man out mm-hmm. of their fucking like wheelchair. Or I remember once seeing this couple with like an infant, like a fresh baby, you know, where they're not even cute yet. They're like, oh, that's they're still not waxy. Kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they took they the the kid was sleeping and that's so important for a baby that age. Mm-hmm. And the parents just look exhausted. They clearly just had it. I bet this woman still had fucking episiotomy stitches. That's how fresh this baby was. And they pick the fucking TSA agents pick up this infant to make sure there are no like bombs under it. <laughs> Insane and, like, behavior. Wake up this baby and these exhausted people. They're confused too. They don't speak English. They don't know what's going on. They're exhausted. They're alarmed. Why is this stranger in a uniform touching their baby who they probably just got to sleep? Like everyone 
if they actually take a moment to think about it, is horrified by that kind of security state atmosphere. The problem is with that, though, is that a, a lot of younger people don't remember anything different, and then a lot of yeah. Americans don't fly. But I think entering into this conversation with things that people actually experience and see is going to be a little bit easier because so much of this stuff is now way more invisible. It's not it's not body bags coming home from Vietnam. It's it's, yeah. it's secret. Yeah. The, the, the problem with the security state and the accepted standard of American security theater is sort of a mirror image of why universal programs are good. These are bad for the reasons that universal programs are good. If people like Amber just said, they grow up, they don't know anything, but yeah, say universal health care, socialized medicine. It's harder to take it away from them because they, mm -hmm. they can't imagine a world without it. If you just come into this world and your accepted standard is that some fucking drooling authoritarian is going to feel up your genitals, and dig through your shit, you can't imagine a world without it. That's just what it's supposed to be. You can't imagine a world that isn't constantly at war with your country because your country is fucking everywhere because that's always what it's been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit, as long as you're talking about um, things that you see everywhere. And if you are a listener of this show in the state of California, here's something you've been seeing everywhere. The relentless yes on 22 propaganda that has been inundating your state for months and months now. But I just want to talk a little bit about this this Prop 22 issue that's going on in California right now. And I've heard from multiple people that you cannot turn on the TV or listen to the radio anywhere in California without being hit with a blitz of these like baffling and intentionally obfuscatory yes on 22 uh, ads. So much so that apparently, uh, I, I saw a screenshot of this, this is true. Uh, Uber drivers in California, before they can get a new like, uh, uh, like ride or, or fare or whatever, are, are prompted with a, a, a screen on their phone that says yes on 22 or okay. So to get a new fare, they have to either click okay or yes on 22. And then Uber makes that seem that like, well, all our drivers support yes on 22. Now, if you're not aware of what Prop 22 is, it's essentially, it's a ballot well, writers measure. too, though. I, sorry, I have to add this. Writers too, they'll yeah. ask you if you request a ride, Will you vote yes on twenty two? And that's Jesus what you Christ. have to do to get a ride. If you they're say trying to get, they're trying to get you like to get muscle memory. You get in the booth, you just go boop. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. Now it's like so. So Prop twenty two is is another one of these like just asinine ballot measures where it's like I don't know why America's largest state is run in this fashion where just every fucking idiot gets to like vote on these ballot measures that like if you went into the voting booth without any prior knowledge and just tried to read or understand what you were voting on it would be virtually impossible like if you read the text of it it's just like would you like a world in which uh gig economy and uh workers are not yet but also possibly made uh, have a better life that will uh, never happen to have been the thing that you uh maybe want it's just like this this total deluge of like passive voice and weirdly worded things to give you the impression. A lot of double negatives. Yeah, a lot of double negatives to give you the impression that like this is a, a ballot measure that will support the people working in the gig economy when it is in fact the exact opposite of that. I mean, it is a ballot measure that would allow companies like Uber, Lyft, Instacart, whatever, like any of these gig economy delivery or rideshare uh, companies the ability to uh, permanently like never classify the people who work for them as employees and as such never like you know just keep them in a, a pre precarious contractor status without any uh, ability for them to advocate for themselves i mean I, uh have you guys uh, just been following this prop 22 thing at all yeah so i'm i you know i'm of two minds about this because when i did i i did a series of like uh talks on labor with like you know, union leaders and stuff. And one of them was with um, the head of like the New York City Cab Union and everything. And one of them was specifically with like a labor lawyer. And we were looking at like, okay, well, there are a few different approaches to this and they always sort of like balance each other. One is like the legalistic view where it's like you're fighting for protectionist labor law. But the problem is it becomes this chicken and egg thing where it's like, well, you need a powerful union and, and, and unified workers' movement first to get that. And to get that, which does shore up the power of the already powerful... It's very confusing to figure out which, 
which thing has to come first or, or whatever. And like, ultimately, it's gone both directions historically. Like, uh, labor law has given uh, unions a leg up when um, they were sort of ascendant, but maybe not super strong. But also, uh, labor law protections have proven to not, been, not be a very good bulwark at all sometimes. Um, so it's like, do we turn to the law or do we turn to organizing? And it's obviously, it's not an either or thing, like one hand washes the other, but this is one situation where I actually am very sympathetic to the kind of legalistic approach. One, because it's, it's a weird fucking moment. And because of like pandemic economics and this, and the, and the way like everything has shifted towards gig economy and, these are workers that are weirdly in a, in a really like uniquely like, I don't want to say powerful, but a potentially advantageous position. Like, I think actually getting qualified as employees would be a great foot in the door. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think like just the fact that they're fighting it so hard does actually indicate that they know that there's potential. Yeah. I mean, I get like emails with like videos. They, they pick a lot of older people who can't work consistently. One I saw, there was like this very old man who was like, uh, you know, I have a medical condition and I can't work regularly. So Uber works really well for me. And what he meant is that he wanted like a flexible schedule. Yes. Um, That's how they're also, selling this. Yeah, exactly. But also like, you should be retired, first of all. You're so old. You should just be receiving a pension. Like, yeah. you should just be taken care of. Like, it's just the standards are so... And God knows what kind of a bonus he got for appearing in the commercial, or maybe he really believes it. I don't know. I have no idea. But, like, again, like you said, the idea that you should vote on all of these details when we don't have the means by which to like educate every Californian on what Prop 22 actually is and like Uber and Grubhub and all of these companies have so many resources to to spread disinformation and to to mislead and misrepresent what this law actually is. I know for a fact there are people who think Prop 22 is actually a worker friendly piece of legislation. If you if you look at any of the uh, like the campaign literature about Prop 22, it is all in the language of um, uh, Prop 22. Why you should why you support Prop 22? It protects the ability of app based drivers to choose independent work. It provides drivers new benefits and protections. It saves hundreds of thousands of jobs. It preserves food and grocery delivery and rideshare services that millions rely on. It implements strong new public safety protections. And it's it's all it's all couched in this language of like the freedom of the individual driver or delivery person to, you know, work their own schedule, sort of make the job whatever they want and like just be free to essentially not have uh, a salary or benefits of any kind and to be yeah, like well, and, instantly disposable. And yeah, yeah, instantly disposable and to essentially not receive the kind of legal designation that would allow them to form institutions like unions. Like exactly. it, it's literally, it, it keeps them from, again, like you, you can't rely entirely on laws, obviously like laws, especially labor laws, especially in a country that is actually 50 little countries aren't the best protection for this sort of thing. But California is a huge fucking state. And right now, drivers, delivery people, like these people are in a weirdly advantageous position actually putting them in the same basket, legally speaking, is a great position for bargaining negotiate negotiations and organizing. So I really, really hope people see through this. And I really, really hope that... And without... And, like, obviously the people who are uh, support a no on 22 do not have anything like even a fraction of the resources that Uber alone has thrown at them. Right. Like, I mean, they've dedicated of billions of dollars to a, a massive propaganda campaign that I think has been very effective at using the language of like workers' rights and freedom and, you know, uh, you know, protecting jobs to you know, hoodwink people into thinking that this is a some sort of favor that these companies are doing for the people who drive and deliver food for them. And, you know, I mean, I, like, it's just, I mean, it, w it, w it would take a huge amount of like public education to, and like, you know, advertising, quite frankly, to move the needle on that. Because like I said, if you go in and just read the ballot initiative, it would be very easy to be tricked into thinking that you are supporting gig economy workers by voting for this measure. 
And I mean, again, like uh, to your earlier point, Amber, I mean, like the simplest case to make is if, if this were really about helping their, their drivers, like why would Uber and these companies be spending billions to stop to pass this amendment right. out, of the, out of the kindness of their hearts? You should be questioning the, but I do think people are, I mean, like middle class liberals anyway, I do think they have a weird thing with like tech where they think it's like the nice, the nice capitalists. I think, I really yeah, think yeah, they you're right. think that. You're definitely right. I think, I, yeah, like, they, they, hey, these are the guys who wear turtlenecks and quarter zip fleeces. You know, they're, they're yeah, not like, they're, chill. they're not wearing some pinstripe suit like a square. They let uh, me bring my dog to work. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think we need like a, a Prop 22 for the CIA. You know, just let them make their own schedules, have soft serve ice cream <laughs> in, the, in the cafeteria, things like that. Ping pong table in the torture dungeon. You know, you don't ever have, you ever have to go home. You don't have to go Open home. Open office to plan. Some yeah. shitty fucking suburb in Virginia or Maryland. You can just stay in that Langley building all day having fun with your friends. Actually, um, the open office plan, it, it, it would be maybe the most radical thing because then they could never keep secrets. Like everyone could see everyone else's work and someone would be zooming by on a little, you know, zip scooter or whatever. And it's like, oh, there's no such thing as confidential anymore. So I better not do anything too evil because literally everyone can see it. Or, you know, you, I mean, you can't be tubing like tubing, you know, in the open office plan. <laughs> you got to keep that tube in your pants, you know, and then if, like if, we, if, they, if we do, if we pass Prop 22 for the CIA, I mean, like they can have their dicks out in the office place. Uh, they have the freedom uh, to do that now. Prop 20 tubing. <laughs> All right. Well, we're almost done for today's show, but uh, I think I should just get one more uh, California based plug in here. Uh, and that is for uh, Nithya Raman for L.A. City Council. Uh, if you are in L.A., I know you've and you're listening to this show. I know you've heard us interview her twice, but I just want to bring this up once again because the election is very soon. She has a extremely good chance of beating uh, David Ryu, the incumbent. And I just want to note that Nithya was just endorsed by Bernie Sanders and shortly following that endorsement, her opponent, Ryu, has been endorsed by Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton right. has decided... That's right. To- she came in from the woods. Remember that? Remember when she went to the woods? Well, she's like back. Like a Yeti. Like and a she's Yeti. like, oh, God. This really does tell you, oh, yeah, city council in L.A. really is wildly overpowered. Like, when they were building the Sim City, they fucked up the sliders on how powerful city councilmen are individually. So... She's I mean, actually coming like ridiculously to, close to threatening power, as you can see from people like Hillary Clinton and fucking Nancy Pelosi weighing in on this shit. Just parachuting well, I, in to endorse her opponent. I mean, they're doing such a good job of supporting um, uh, female candidates. Uh, and, you know, because, you know, men. How about no? How about no more male politicians? Oh, except for this one. I love, though, that apparently uh, Josh Olsen was telling me this. Apparently, like. Ryu retweeted his endorsement from Hillary Clinton and it got like 28 retweets. Oh, <laughs> ow. That woman is, she is an influencer. She yep. just repels <laughs> influence. She has the opposite of every intended effect. It's just, she just, everything she touched turns to death. It's amazing. Yep. She That's, is the least relevant person on earth, which is more than anything how you know Trump has kind of lost it because he keeps trying to make Hillary right. happen again. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Buddy, we have all moved on, weak. man. That's weak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we all just want to pretend like she didn't happen, and you're going back to it. That well is dry. And the Q people think she's been dead for four years. <laughs> <laughs> the David David Ryu's most recent tweet from two days ago: one retweet, one like, eight replies. Ooh. Yep. Oh. Oh. You got no, that you got that Hillary curse, man. You got it on you. You got well, it on you. You got the stank. He's got the Hillary stank. Well, I mean, this is this is this is very good news for I think a very, very worthy candidate in Nithya Raman. Uh if you haven't listened to my our interviews with her, uh check it out. But if you are in LA and in her district, I or just I cannot recommend voting for her enough. She she can win. And like I said, just if you need any other nudge in the right direction, Hillary Clinton endorsed her opponent. So what else do you need to know about her? You don't don't even look at her website or issues page or anything like the that. The ultimate counterindicator. Yeah, exactly. And uh yeah, and, and and you know, if you're not in her district, now would be a good time to donate some money to that campaign. I have, we will have the donation link. I would really, really like to see Nithya Raman win this race, and she definitely can. Uh, with your help and the Chapo bump. So I would just like to leave you with that. Once again, one more final boost for our girl Nithya Raman for LA City Council. So I think that about uh, does it.